after the First World War I, as they call it, in 1914, in the years ensuing that war, thousands of African Americans migrated to northern cities, such as Newark, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and in particular, a city that I would like to talk about today, Detroit. Detroit is a city that is well known for its automobile industries. It's known as the Motor Town. And the reason why is because between 1880 and 1920, these 40 years, Detroit grew into the fourth largest city in the United States, right behind Chicago, Philadelphia, and New York. A large number of migrants initially were Jewish migrants, came from Eastern Europe. But in the 1914 and years ensuing of that, what happened is you had a lot of African-American migrants coming from the rural South as well to the city of Detroit. And most of them started to live in the same neighborhood which was once, which was once where the Jewish migrants used to live. So the Jewish migrants, their children started to move out of the city into some of the outposts of the city and the homes that they left behind were settled by the African-American incoming migrants. That particular neighborhood is one that goes north and south in the city of Detroit, and it is known by the name of the Hastings Streets neighborhood because there was this one large major road called Hastings Streets which went north and south, and there were homes, grocery shops, uh, theaters, um, drug stores, uh, nightclubs, uh, etc., that were peppered around this particular uh, street. And so it came to be known as the Hastings Street neighborhood. Now, what happens is, is that in the mid-50s, the city of Detroit decides to completely level the Hastings Street's neighborhood and put in place a large highway, which is called the Chrysler Highway. It's this highway I-75 that you can see my uh, hand uh, pointing to on the map. And a lot of it uh, allows us to understand why this would happen because effectively the industries which used to support Detroit um, during the early 20th century, primarily speaking the car manufacturing plants such as the Ford, Henry Ford's uh, uh, plants, they started to put their new plants on the outskirts of the city. Okay, what counts as the outskirts? The outskirts of Detroit would be neighborhoods uh, such as uh, Highland Park S counts as one of the outskirts, just although it is still uh, very close to Detroit. Um, but there are other various outskirts as well where you would have these uh, uh, car plants move out to, such as Livonia down here, uh, west of Detroit. Uh, where did it go? Lavonia would be. Can't find it now. Here it is. Lavonia. Dearborn is also one of the suburbs of Detroit. Um, and uh, this, by the way, is one of Henry Ford's automobile plants and called the Ford plant near the River Rouge. One of the reasons why this plant is well known is because this is where Henry Ford, the interior of the plant is designed to institute what is called the assembly line of work, where what happens is you have a kind of like uh, when you go to an airport and uh, you're picking up your uh, your suitcase, one of those uh, things that moves around, I'm forgetting what it's called in English, uh, the, the, forgetting the name for it, but anyways, you have the the items uh, for the car, like the, the the metals, the steel, everything is moving on this thing, and you have individuals stationed at particular parts sections uh, of this thing moving, and they just stand still there and they do whatever it's, they are supposed to do. They're not supposed to know exactly how to build a car uh, by themselves. All they can do is they can just follow the instructions that is given just for them and for their particular task. What happens as a result is you're able to build a car because let's say you got 60 people, everybody's standing at their stations, uh, the revolver, uh, the revolving um, uh, belt, the revolving belt, right? So you got 
you got these uh, little uh, 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 things moving on the belt and you just put whatever you're supposed to put and then the belt keeps moving. Effectively, it increases efficiency, all right, because you're able to build a car really quickly, but the workers don't really gain any skills because they don't really know exactly how this car is built. The process is very mysterious for them too because they're not really building the car even though they're playing a role in its building, right? Because everyone is doing a little bit. Nobody really knows how to build it all together, right? It's um, Think of it like a mathematical equation where you don't really know the theory behind the mathematical equation, but you just know one particular step that you're supposed to do. And you don't even know all the steps. You just know your one, one step. So you would never know how to actually solve the equation if it was just given to you. But you can solve, you can just perform that one part that was given to you. So it automates the worker because it reduces the, it, you know, if, if, you're, uh, um, if you're Henry Ford, you can easily fire a worker and hire someone else because, you know, the worker doesn't really have the skills that you need them for. You, can, you don't have to value the worker because they don't have any skills. You can just replace one and have somebody else. So in other words, the virtues of a good worker in this particular context is someone who's obedient, follows orders, and uh, is willing to stand stationary because there's not a lot of movement happening. There's not a lot of communication happening between workers as well, right? It's the exact opposite of what you would consider to be a good, well-oiled basketball team, for instance, where the point guard has to talk to the center. Someone has got to give a screen. You've got to throw the ball, move it around. You've got to talk a lot. You've got to be able to communicate with each other. You've got to know the entire offensive plan and how it's supposed to move. doesn't matter whether it's the shooting guard or the point forward or sitting on the bench, etc. Everyone knows the system, right? Here, no one knows the system because everyone is just doing what they're supposed to do. And they're just given orders and they're following these instructions. So but anyways, Henry Ford's river, uh, the, this, uh, this particular plant would employ a lot of people, including many African-Americans for whom, um, uh, uh, for whom the assembly line work uh, 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 position was the most uh, valued, it was the most prized working position out there. It was akin to modern day working for like Google or working for Accenture or working for um, working at Silicon Valley, working at on and uh, in some kind of like a technology hub, uh, building a new app um, that uh, that seems uh, cutting edge and innovative. It was the sign of innovation back then, even though presently, as we look back in retrospect, it seems very regressive, but that is the irony and paradox of modernity itself, right? Modernity um, promises to be new, promises to be uh, innovative, but oftentimes it is not so new and it is definitely not very innovative either, right? It promises to cure problems, to solve issues, but in so but actually exacerbates problems and creates more problems as a result, right? We have known that and we are knowing that very much today as well as we sit in our cities in 2021 and think about, you know, the ways in which uh, digital technologies, consulting firms, software companies are heightening tensions, exacerbating uh, inequality, creating conditions uh, where people feel that their labor is it is incredibly devalued. So this is a history that we're repeating presently as well. But as at all times, what happens is there are certain forces at play, certain technologies that create new ways of working, like working in the assembly line, which was a very foreign thing to do for many of these African-American migrants who, as, a, uh, as you recall, I said, came from uh, places in the rural south and like like Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Piedmont Valley, uh, Mississippi Delta, etc., Alabama, Mississippi, and they would have uh, been accustomed to working um, as uh, sharecroppers, uh, working on fields that were owned by white uh, uh, farm owners, but uh, were leased to African American farmers to grow crops, and re in return be able to live. Uh, for reduced rent or sometimes rent free, uh, but you never the the sharecropper doesn't own the land. They work on the land, and uh, they're not in control of the distribution of the crops they grow. Um, but nevertheless, there's a very different way of working as a sharecropper because you're still working on uh, on fields. Uh, there's a certain rhythm to working on, on the fields. Uh, one thing I learned recently is that for many of 
the sharecroppers listening to the blues genre of music was one of the ways in which they would actually compartmentalize the work that they had to do right uh, like for us maybe uh, it may involve waking up drinking a cup of coffee and then uh, you know quickly brushing your teeth and hopping in a car and uh, taking the highway maybe that's a rhythm for many people to work right but for a lot of these folks uh, who were sharecroppers the way in which they would uh, experience time working is by listening to the blues it uh, it's a very different way of thinking about how you condition the body to engage in productive work um, uh, when you put it in contrast to what's happening in the assembly line right in the assembly line there is no music uh, there is no movement and um, it, there is not a lot of touch uh, with the land you're just uh, following some instruction and uh, following commands right it is akin to uh, kind of like the computer um, responding to the commands of the programmer which is how most assume computers to to operate uh, that they are just a set of algorithms that they're supposed to uh, compute right but as we know with computers there are bugs computer revolts computer doesn't follow the commands and such is the case with the workers as well in detroit uh, what i want to focus on is a particular story of clara mohammed who was the wife of elijah mohammed one of the persons who was employed and and then fired from jobs working at the Sh the Chrysler and the Chevrolet car plants in Detroit uh, struggled uh, keeping a job uh, and staying afloat and is definitely struggled a lot it's in the immediate aftermath of this event called the stock market crash of 1929 which uh, propelled or uh, precipitated the Great Depression basically what happens is that the city starts to lose money because the city of Detroit was heavily dependent on the money that was accrued by corporate elites like Henry Ford. As the city starts to lose money, people are unemployed. They are not able to pay their taxes. So there's very little tax base. So there's a lot of slashing of funds to things like the public school system in Detroit, which after the Great Depression would go into a free fall. And its graduates would just extend the line of the unemployed men who were already waiting for jobs. Many thought that the Great Depression would be not a Great Depression when the, it was actually happening. So like in the 1930 and 1931, many thought, you know, one more year and the economy will rebound. That this would be a very short, sporadic, uh, sporadic uh, you know, uh, accident and things will uh, improve. And so the panic didn't really set in initially because there was still this assumption that okay you know the unemployed will start to become employed within two to three years but then that's not what happens it it takes decades and decades there is a massive race riots in the early 1940s and many would argue detroit never really recovered it never was able to regain its uh it is its its allure as one of this great bustling industrious city the smart ones were the ones who understood that the Great Depression would be a seismic event. It would con it would fundamentally change a lot of things that are happening in Detroit, right? But they also were acutely aware that with the destruction that comes about as a result of the Great Depression, there will be opportunities to do things differently as well. In particular, we got to think about the ways in which the Great Depression is going to recede confidence in these corporate elites. and and make people reassess some of their assumptions like do you really want to be working in the assembly line you know this is something that may happen in our present context as well currently uh, consulting firms like Deloitte uh, and uh, tech companies like Google uh, are highly valued they're seen as almost like prophetic figures whatever they say is correct um, their insights are seen as the most smartest ones out there. But if indeed we do have a massive market crash, people will start to request, start to question. You know, they will start to wonder, do I really want to be a computer programmer? Do I want to, really want to learn coding? What do I gain from learning uh, a Python or some other coding, uh, some other uh, uh, computing language program? You know, uh, do I want to... And do I, but at the same time, the question will be, do I just completely get rid of it or do I want to do things in a, in a very different way? This is one of the questions that 
women in Detroit were also facing because what happens is that the way of work in the assembly line is also being pushed into the homes, into the realm of what many people call the domestic sphere, which means house management, raising children, motherhood, maternal practices in and around the home. There is usually a kind of a dichotomy created between industrial work and domestic work, by which I mean that places like the automobile plants and other industries in Detroit would not hire women. Women's work was very much limited to things that were perceived to be what women are supposed to do, like taking care of children. However, that dichotomy collapses when you think about the ways in which the house is also being remade into a factory. Uh, into a kind of an assembly line. And here women are supposed to produce children and produce them akin to the ways in which the assembly line worker is supposed to produce the car. There is a set of instructions given uh, and women are supposed to kind is supposed to just constantly monitor their children. Um, in the process, they don't really forge a relationship with their children and the relationship is just one based on surveilling the child. Um, which is kind of akin to what's happening in the assembly line where the person is producing the car, but they don't really know exactly how they were able to produce the car. They're just following certain instructions. So what do I mean by instructions for mothers? Think about manuals, parental manuals, uh, manuals of how to raise children, what to do in the morning, what to, how much time should children spend in the restroom, how much time they should spend uh, sleeping, what should they eat for breakfast, Every aspect of life, every hour over the course of the 24 hours, you start to compartmentalize and you start to uh, become very rigid and, and follow a certain set of rules of how to raise a child. You have the advent or the emergence of new social scientific fields that are taking, uh, that are instituting these new uh, uh, mechanisms to make motherhood a scientific endeavor a science that is very much emulating the kind of science which is being put in place at the Henry Ford River Rouge plant. In particular, I'm thinking about psychology, I'm thinking about child development theory, I'm thinking about social work. These are all fields that are considered social sciences, the science of understanding the human body and understanding human relationships, right? Um, so in particular, the relationship between the child and the mother, which becomes a very uh, important relationship um, because it is seen as uh, fundamental to the, to the growth of the child and the, and the ability of the child to succeed at life. So what happens is that there's a woman by the name of Clara Muhammad whose husband is uh, struggling in the immediate aftermath of the Great Depression. She has about seven to eight young ch young children at her home, all, you know, between the ages of child, like a two-year-old to like a 10-year-old, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, close in age to one another. And there is a discourse and a suspicion that women who have too many children are a threat to public health because by having too many children, they're demonstrating that they don't have control over their bodies. And so they would be more at risk of spreading infectious diseases uh, because infectious diseases are spread through bodily contact. This is a new science of germ theory, which says that when more bodies are close to each other and when more bodies are moving around, the chances of infectious diseases spread is heightened. That's how we get quarantines, uh, contact tracing, etc. The advent of public health also has a lot to do with this particular time period I'm talking about, which is roughly speaking late 19th, early 20th century. Now, one of the interesting categories of disease that they introduced during this particular time period is called feeble mindedness. Uh, another way to think about it is weak mindedness. Feeble mindedness was in many ways a far more scarier kind of disease because it did not manifest in some kind of physiological changes on the body. Unlike tuberculosis or influenza, you do not have bodily ailments that would signal that you are sick. Instead, these were sicknesses of the invisible realm of the mind, meaning it was a sickness which was 
reflected by a person's inability to understand how to behave in certain scenarios, what to do when something happens, uh, how to understand and read s situations. And it had everything to do with protecting the body because reading situations, behavior had everything to do with being able to police and regulate and surveil your body because your body was thought of as something that is out of control. Now, for Clara Muhammad, she is acutely aware that she could easily be targeted for spreading contagious diseases because her decision to have eight children could be seen as a sign of her feeble-mindedness, her inability to control her body. Fecundity, reproduction, sexual desire, women's body becomes a site of contagion because women's body are seen as things that are supposed to be sheltered and protected um, and confined in and around the home. Now, what Clara does, and this is very interesting when you think about Clara, and before I say what Clara does, remember, reproduction is a very important site of contestation. Um, African-American women were having more children than white women in this particular time period, and there was an acute fear that of that white women were lagging behind in fertility and reproduction in comparison to African-American women. And so these new scientific forms of motherhood are being advanced to exclude black women from the category of motherhood, to suggest that African-American women who are having so many children are actually incapable of raising children, and therefore to castigate aspersions and scrutiny over these women's capacity to actually raise children. So a lot of this is these, these new scientific forms of motherhood are being introduced to stall the birth rate of African-American women and doing so through this new uh, configuration of motherhood as a particular kind of science. Apart from such pastoral mechanisms like having social workers make home visits and take notes on what's happening inside the home, um, find problems in the home, look at the ways in which the women are not raising their children the proper way, and other pastoral mechanisms like having stool, school attendance enforced so that the children of these African-American migrant women are spending time uh, being supervised by women who are trained in the social scientific fields of psychology and social work or child development. Beyond these pastoral mechanisms, you have some more coercive mechanisms too, such as sterilization, which is really just making the body being incapable of producing more children as well as incarceration. So when you think about prisons, uh, when you think about the police, uh, and you think about African-American women's experiences as incarcerated folks, a lot of it has to do with fertility and reproduction. Uh, the fecund women, the hypersexual women, is seen as a woman who needs to be put behind bars uh, to be controlled, her body to be controlled. So Clara Mohammed is acutely aware of these things. She's acutely aware that in this particular time period, spending time at home is valued. Looking after your children is valued. But what she finds problems with the progressive reforms that are being introduced, like scientific motherhood, and specifically the reform being that children ought to spend time in the public school system, and it's a mandatory thing, it is a public health mandate, just like today we have public health mandates of wearing masks inside restrooms, um, getting COVID screening if you're going to the airport, etc. Uh, in other words, it would be illegal to not follow these laws, right? You could get into legal trouble. You could have the police standing outside your doors for not sending your children to school. Truancy becomes criminalized, for instance. She f the problem she finds is, is that these new laws of reforming motherhood is actually not doing good enough of a job of looking after the children. So she uses the same argument that is being used, which is that mothers ought to look after their children instead of working on the streets, working for for money, doing paid labor, etc. And instead, they need to just be focused on their children in the home. She's using the same argument against the people who are proponents of that argument, against the progressive era leaders, the educators, the legislators, the mayors, the corporate elites, the psychologists, the social workers, etc. All these professionals, the social scientists, the natural scientists, the politicians, the, the, the lawmakers, etc. She's arguing against them by saying, 
you have actually failed to understand what are some of the big key issues that our children face, some of the pressing problems, which one of them was malnutrition. So Clara's daughter, Lottie, one of the children of Clara, she, when she was attending Detroit public school system, she would um, routinely feel uh, hungry uh, that the school system failed to adequately feed the children, except one teacher that Lottie had who was uh, uh, aware of what is happening and he would share his lunch with her. Um, broadly speaking, the Detroit public school system failed to feed its children. And Lottie would also, was also very petite. Clara herself was petite. She was about five feet tall, very uh, short uh, in, in stature. And Laurie uh, was, again, her body features, she looked much younger than her actual age because uh, on top of being pe petite, she's not being well fed, right? So it exacerbates the look of her as if she's much younger than she was actually. So she doesn't, she's not growing in body the way she ought to be. And add that with a shorter, short height uh, accentuates, makes her look much younger than she is. So what happens is Clara starts to look for solutions. Um, to this urban crisis of lack of food. Um, the Detroit city has its solutions to this problem, which is called the public market. There is an Eastern market in Detroit um, up here, the Eastern market. And this is a public market where people would, you know, the city's residents would be able to come and purchase food. What I want you to think about is the ways in which, you know, certain health issues become visible and at other times become obfuscated, right? So malnutrition is a key health crisis, but it is being obfuscated by this excessive emphasis on the mind as and the body that needs to be in control, right? The city is focusing so much on feeble-mindedness, focusing so much on containing the body, on regulating the body, that it fails to understand that the body is actually yearning for food, yearning for healthy meals. That it, 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 that its yearnings are not always a bad thing. That its yearnings will not always lead to the spread of diseases, but rather can also be the source of health. And this is where food becomes really important because when you think about food, you have to think about how it is that at certain times we are very acutely aware of our diet, the impact that food has on our health and well-being, and at other times we are completely unaware of the impact it may have on our health and diet, right? So, for instance, did you know that white bread is bad for your health? Did you know that sugar is bad for your health? Did you know that uh, the cereal they make for children, like Fruit Loops, is not good for your health? Did you know how much sugar intake you do when you eat that kind of cereal. Now, if you ask these questions to somebody living in the 1950s and 60s, they would answer no. Uh, they would say that eating Fruit Loops, is, Fruit Loops is a sign of status. That's a great thing to be doing this. And uh, they would, uh, you know, be completely aloof about the impact that the food they intake has on their bodies. At other times, that is not the case. At other times, we're very heightened about the kind of food we eat. We say that we should just resort to a plant-based based diet because if you don't eat plant-based food, you know, you're going to impede your body's ability to restore itself and to rebuild itself. Uh, you can think about athletes nowadays. You know, they're moving. And like Tom Brady, for instance, just won a Super Bowl. He's about 40 years of age. Nobody saw that happening uh, or saw that coming despite how great of an athlete he is. Nobody thought he would be performing at this level at this age but one of the ways in which he's able to is because there is greater awareness of the benefits of a plant-based diet uh, for these athletes so they're not eating meat they're not drinking they are have a very rigid schedule they wake up at a particular time they eat breakfast at a certain time they eat lunch at a certain time they don't overeat they don't eat too much rice etc etc next thing you know their body is able to perform at an age that back in the day you would have never thought a body could perform that well right people are looking physically younger at 41 than they did at the age of 34 like 40 50 years ago you can look at pictures of people from the 1960s at the age of 34 they look like we would look at the age of 54. Um, so a lot of that has to do with our greater awareness of food progressive era is that particular moment too where there's a acute awareness that the kind of food you eat 
has a certain impact on your body. And as a result, there is this greater uh, suspicion of overeating, that eating too much. So while once upon a time, being robust, being uh, well-fed was sign of health and sign of prosperity, during the progressive era, being well-fed could have been seen as being overly fed. And fat becomes a sign of illness. Um, and too much food becomes the problem to our food justice issue. Uh, and lack of quality food is something that people start to pay attention to. So this is something we're very well aware of in our present day moment. We're acutely aware that the problem is not so much of dearth of food, but rather excessive food that is not good for us, at least in some circles, which includes, I bet, my students who, are, who do demonstrate that awareness in their writing. We see that in the progressive era as well. With the Eastern market, there is this point being made about people being having access to good food. Okay, But there's a certain invisibility nonetheless. And this is what modernity does. Modernity creates visions of a reformed, organized, orderly society. But it does so in ways that makes people unaware of how they're getting access to their food, how they're getting access to their water. So when water comes out of your pipelines, when you open the faucet, turn the faucet on, there's water flowing. Where is that water coming from? This is something modernity creates an illusion that we don't have an understanding of where it's coming from, right? With Eastern market as well, the food that, you, that is being sold, we don't really know where that food is coming from. Detroit City is a great example to think about the obfuscation of food and water the ways in which in other words the paradox being is that everything is interconnected but the city is spatially designed such to give the illusion that nothing is connected that things are just mysteriously happening for you right for instance if you were to pay attention to the relationship between food and water there is an important story to be said about what used to exist in Detroit before you had these streets and these highways and these homes and these parks and these cemeteries built. All of this starts to be being, being built in the 1800s. In the 1700s, which is when Detroit was colonized, 1703, 1704, by French missionaries and French military uh, officials, Detroit was basically a complex web of rivers and creeks and green spaces and you had Indian tribes like the Huron tribe who would engage in the selling of fur which was a very prized commodity back then and the French wanted to colonize Detroit because they wanted to build a partnership with these Huron Indians and engage in fur trade with them and while building a partnership with the Huron, they wanted to at the same time stall the progress of the uh, of the Algonquins to go further west. And Algonquins were trying to build a partnership with the British. So a lot of this has to do with the French building partnership with the certain Indian tribes, the other Indian tribes building partnership with the English. This is actually a really good way to think about the complex nature of colonization and the ways in which partnerships are forged amongst and against colonizing forces. The French here are against the British and they're against certain kinds of Indian uh, tribes but not uh, involved building partnerships with other Indian tribes, all because of having uh, uh, participating in the fur trade. They're all trying to vie for the fur trade. So Detroit becomes a key spot for them to colonize, even though back then it was far away into the Western frontier. This was considered the Western edges of America. And what the French do is that they build a fort. A fort is like a neighborhood which is walled in. Um, and it is something that the military is usually very, uh, a kind of a designing of a city that the military usually uh, um, idealizes and values because it protects the city from any kind of incursions. They're very aware that the British may want to attack them. So they build this fort, they enclose the city with walls. And, and, and within these walls, there are these neighborhoods and homes and streets, etc. Now that fort has gone away, what else has gone away also is those 
complex web of rivers and streams and creeks that used to be the marker of Detroit. We know from archives going back then that when these streets did uh, exist, now let me just put this one, here it is. We know from archives that, you know, these complex web of streams were highly valued by the French. They were very aware of how uh, incredibly lucky they were to have uh, these complex, you know, streams and creeks. For instance, I'll read out for you um, by Cadillac, uh, who was one of the uh, generals of one of the French generals. And there were many streams that fed the Detroit River. All these streams, remember, culminate, they fall into the Detroit River, um, which is where the city ends. Across the Detroit River is modern-day Canada. And he says, but one of the rivers that was very well favored by the Cadillacs men, the local Ottoman, was called the Little Savoyard. And it's clean, source deep in the earth. It bordered the western edge of the fort and could be paddled by canoe almost to its end. Its banks were used to picnic and had always set a pretty picture of serenity, a little river that fed the land and nourished its people. A French artisan pulled water from it to make pottery by its banks. His name was Savoy, for which the river is named. The Little River, a prime avenue of life with fish, muskrat, beaver, otter, and dra deer drinking at dawn, a river set in a meadow of richness and beauty, a place where even a tough voyageur may come to sit in silence and replenish his soul. These lands and waters were best described in a letter Comte Pont Chartrain wrote to a friend in Paris. The banks of the river are so vast, so many are so many vast meadows where the freshness of these beautiful streams keep the grass always green. These same meadows are fringed with long, broad avenues of fruit trees, which have never felt the careful hand of the watchful, ga watchful gardener. And fruit trees, young and old, droop under the weight and multitude of their fruit and bend their branches toward the fertile soil which has produced them. Land so fertile, so fertile and beautiful, it may justly be called earthly paradise of North America. And Detroit then was a place the Ojibwe called Ba Wa Teng, a gathering place. Detroit grew slowly at first, but it grew, right? So goes on and talks about how the river Savoyard presently is channeled into Detroit's main sewer system. So if you were wondering where exactly the river Savoyard is, well, you can't really find it today because it's been... buried underneath the city of Detroit, the way we know it today. Um, however, there are ways in which we can see certain residues of River Riverside Royard even to this present day. For instance, if you go back to the Henry Ford, the River Rouge Creek, this right here is one of those creeks, the Rouge River. Okay. So I made this like black mark to show how it descends into the Detroit River. This is the Detroit River. This is the border of the United States and Canada. So you have River Rouge, which still to this present day, you can see, you can, you can, you can see it on the map. Another very eerie residue is this one particular cemetery called Elmwood Cemetery. And on, in Elmwood Cemetery, what you can find is these little gravels placed over, okay? These grates that are covering the overflow of the Savoyard Creek. So beneath these, these outflow, these, these, uh, these things, you got the river underneath it. But what's happened is that the river was transformed into a sewage system. Because as Detroit becomes an industrial city starting in the 1840 and every decade you have more people coming in, you have more industrial waste, right? In building the steel, uh, in building the cars, etc. All the work is creating all this gunk and all this dirt. Um, you develop the sewage system. And all the sewage is being flown into 
the Detroit River because the creek back in the day used to flow into the Detroit River. Now the sewage flows right into the Detroit River, which is why the neighborhood called Hastings Street is also oftentimes referred to as the Black Bottom. The bottom here means the bottom of the river, the bottom of the sewage. This is the last point of the sewage before it descends into the Detroit River. Coincidentally enough, that's where the 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 the, the migrant workers used to live. That was the the because of racial segregation and lack of housing opportunities elsewhere. That's the only place where these incoming migrants would be settling. The bottom of the sewage, right? It's where it's the most stinkiest part of the city. It's the most unhealthy part of the city. Now, the sewage system is usually hailed as a great engineering uh, technology, right? It's again, think about modernity. It calls itself this most innovative thing, right? But what it's really doing when you read the French colonist and you read the letters of Comte Chartrain is the sewage system is destroying this fabulous ecology of Detroit, the ways in which Detroit fed its people, the landscape was feeding its own, right? All the muskrat beavers, the fish, the otter, the deer drinking at dawn, these trees, the fruit trees that have never been felt the careful hand of the watchful gardener. Now you can see the French are also interested in taming the, the nature, right? They also wish there was a gardener who could have a watchful eye over the trees. So the sense that you have to have a watchful eye what does it do eventually, right? You create the city of Detroit into a city where everyone has watchful eye. The Henry Ford has a watchful eye over his worker. The mother is supposed to have a watchful eye over her children. Ultimately, you create a city that is unhealthy, that is feeling malnourished, where children don't have access to great food at their school system, which is ironic and it's tragic because if you had gone back in time Go back into 1704, 1705, you can canoe, you can have fruits, you can eat beaver, you are well nourished, you're well fed, you have a land that is so fertile and beautiful, it's called the earthly paradise of North America. These people feel that they've, you know, they've hit uh, a jackpot in finding Detroit and they were rightly right to assume that. But what happens as a consequence of developing Detroit into this industrial booming city, the fourth largest city in the United States, with all these accolades that come to Detroit, industriousness, innovation, technology, actually the people in the city are not even being well fed. Clara Muhammad is acutely aware of it, but Clara, what she does is, unlike the city because of its public, what city does is it creates these public markets. What Clara does is instead, she brings the public market into the home. Okay, this is a very key point because oftentimes when you read scholarship uh, on women's experiences and you hear about the ways in which women are being limited within the confines of the home, it raises your eyebrows. It makes you think about the ways in which women are being excluded and marginalized from labor systems, which is a very fair uh, scrutiny and suspicion to raise because in many ways they were very much so being marginalized. They couldn't work in the steel industries. They couldn't work in these big buildings that were being built over the Savoyard Creeks, like the Buell building, this particular building where I found this article, right? This is one of the main structures. The Buell building is the, one of the steel buildings. It actually stands a bit of an aberration. It was the only industry which would actually employ African-American women, uh, complete aberration from the rest of them, but nevertheless, uh, very limited in its scope as well. The point is, Buell building's top floor has this place called the Saviot Creek. You could sit there and eat, drink a little margarita overseeing the Detroit River. What people don't know is beneath Buell building is the actual legit Savoyard Creek that has been turned into a sewer system, right? Now, Clara is a conservative woman in terms of she is going back to the home. She's not looking to work for other folks like a domestic servant, which is one of the key ways of in which African-American women were employed. She was not looking to work as a cleaner, etc. She goes back to the home, consolidates the home into the space where the mother is supposed to look after her children. But in so doing, she's doing it in a far different way than the ways in which the progressive reformers wanted women to look after their children. And one of the key differences, again, if you go back to the letter by Pont-Jacques-Train, uh, is this difference between the notion of surveillance 
and and uh, and relation and relationship. Technologies are being built on, around the idea of surveillance, monitoring, standing still, being stationary, following instructions. But Clara is doing things in a very different way. She's able to follow a recipe given to her by the guy, guy by the name of Farad Muhammad. And in following the recipe, what she does is she creates certain changes and additions to her recipe as well. And one of the key recipes is the making of a navy bean soup. So the navy bean soup, Farad says, you got to find pink bean somewhere. All these women, Clara and our friends, they look for pink bean. They might have gone to the Eastern market. I don't know, but we don't know where exactly they ended up. But they were able to come back and tell Farad, good news is we were able to find some bean soup. The bad news, however, is that we couldn't find pink bean. Instead, we were able to find navy bean. And Farah says, you know what, that will actually work. That's okay. That's no big deal. You can use navy bean as well to make this bean soup. So she learns how to make the bean soup. She implements that as part of a recipe in her home school that she begins. She is the first African-American woman to start a homeschool movement. And she turns her home into a school called the University of Al-Islam. So Islam here becomes a process whereby African-American women are creating their own visions of modernity, their own understandings of health, their own understandings of motherhood, which are in many ways similar, but drastically different than uh, the kind of modernity that was being designed in Detroit. Similar as in, it has that feature of women are supposed to look after their children, women are supposed to consolidate the home, they are supposed to think of motherhood as a kind of a science, which can help raise healthy children. But the science itself is now being animated by a religious tradition of Islam, as opposed to the social scientific fields of psychology and social work. The key difference when you think about religion here is that religion has a very different understanding of the human body, where the body is not a bad thing. Body can regenerate itself. Body, when fed healthy, nutritious food, will not be feeble-minded, but instead have that sense of strong-mindedness. And that is one of the key differences because for psychology and other social scientific fields, the body can only do bad things unless you're constantly surveilling it and constantly thinking about your inner emotions as opposed to the emotions you're building with one another. Because these outer emotions, according to psychology, the twin bodies can be a side of disease because the outer emotions that people form one, with one another leads to more bodily contact, leads to more heightened emotions, according to the psychologist. But emo Clara, what she found is that the emotions between the bodies, the sense of compassion amongst each other, um, if you can think about the relationship between one another, relationship with ancestors, with God, with, the, with, with nature, these are ways in which the body can be healed as well. So to think about food here, right, food and water, Claire is acutely aware that eating well is important. There is some rigid discipline in the body happening too. This is not just some kind of like sitting together and having a good time. Body is being heavily disciplined. Clara's institutes a policy where people's weight would be measured, right? So you had to maintain a certain weight. For women, it was about 120 pounds. And for men, it was, I think, 145 or 150 and you were supposed to, you were scaled, you could not, you would be penalized if you went above weight, your membership in the community very much dependent on you being able to maintain a certain weight. That is very much that progressive zeal as well to regulate and discipline bodies. But this kind of disciplining in being so similar also produces all vastly different results. It produces Islam. It gives rise to the uh, tradition of Islam in America. And again, it is animated by a certain understanding of the body where discipline is good, but discipline is good in terms of forming relationships with one another, not in terms of divorcing bodies from one another. Because the public school, again, remember, it was taking the kids out of the homes, putting them under surveillance and supervision of women trained in psychology so that these children were not supposed to spend time with their own mothers, right? These scientific forms of motherhood are being established to attack African-American women from having the capacity to perform motherhood. Clara is able to affirm or reaffirm her ability to raise her children through the tradition of Islam. She's able to co forge a different kind of motherhood, one which is based in the home rather than in the Detroit public school system, and consolidate her home as a site of health when 
all these social workers and 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 childcare development people, etc., were seeing these homes as dilapidated spaces, as places of disease and infestation. She was able to turn it into a space of health, a space of education, literacy, intelligence, everything that City of Detroit extol, uh, extolled. But at a particular time, when City of Detroit itself was undergoing a massive economic clash. Uh, a crash called the Great Depression. And Claire was acutely aware. She knew that Detroit won't have a big comeback in a few years. She was very well aware that she would have to think creatively out of the box and not rely extensively on the social workers in the city's education system for raising her children. So I hope this was helpful to think about the relationship between food and the city and food and religion. In particular, to think about the ways in which Cities are designed such that we fail to understand where our food is coming from. This is Alcon's biggest critique of the going organic movement, which is that when you go to the organic grocery store, you still have no clue where this food comes from. You still don't have any relationship to the food that you're purchasing because you don't have a relationship to a land. Clara finds herself in a predicament. She's not able to have ownership of land. She barely has access to a small little apartment complex in Hastings Street, the Black Bottom neighborhood, dilapidated homes, working class neighborhood, a neighborhood where African-American migrants had to settle because they couldn't find housing elsewhere. Yet nevertheless, she's able to do something about the issue of food injustice, right? She's able to create a food, inclusive food movement uh, uh, that is animated by the tradition of Islam, guided by the insights of Farad Muhammad on how to uh, uh, create a recipe for the navy bean soup. A very simple recipe, but a recipe that is deeply nutritious, high in nutrition value, low in calories, and very cheap. And something that allows these African-American women not to be begging to these social workers for um, welfare money and to be independent. So I hope this was very useful for you to think about River Savoyard, and how the city is built over it, how the city creates illnesses as a consequence of building uh, over it. And even though Clara does not have access to River Savoyard, um, River Savoyard has been buried underneath the sewer. It's been turned into a sewage system. And she's living at the bottom of that sewage system. She's living above the, where the sewage ends, right, and culminates and flows into the Detroit River. Yet nevertheless, she's able to, like, punch uh, create a system at, in the home which allows her children to replenish their soul, replenish their bodies with healthy meals.